Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, I'm Brian Warren. Today, our show centers around the ongoing impact music, media, and film have in changing lives for the better. Joining me in studio are filmmakers Jason Barbeck and Raphael Kalamat, who are founders of KIF. Now, that is the Canadian International Faith and Family Film Festival in Toronto. And they're here to share about their own journeys as well as to talk about the incredible story of this amazing festival. Take a look. Please welcome with me to the 700 Club Canada, the founders of the Canadian International Faith and Family Film Festival, both Jason and Raphael. Wow, so good to How see you, you guys. Thanks you for too. having us. You know, we, we know a lot about TIFF, but we haven't heard a lot about KIFF. <laughs> and I really believe that you guys are on to something, and this is, this, is, this is a tsunami. It is really huge, uh, because media is such a powerful tool in our generation. How did you get involved in this, and how did you guys come together? Well, Jason and I have known each other as uh, performers. We're uh, union performers, and we're union producers with the Canadian Media Producers Association, mm. as well as ACTRA, the Alliance of Canadian Radio and Television Artists. Yes. So we met on set, uh, on the set of Flashpoint and uh, worked our way through that. I remember Flashpoint. Yeah. <laughs> oh. We had wigs on, we're double in the drivers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we worked on Murdoch Mysteries as well as a few other shows and we had a lot in common. Yeah. And then we, we finally got together and made a film called Adam's Testament. Yes. And that's a faith-based supernatural drama and we tried to get the film out there but we realized how difficult it is to get a faith film out there and by traveling the film festival circuit and the uh, conference circuit in the US we saw that these films never really get shown mm. so we decided to get together and see how we could put a film festival together in Toronto it was much needed yeah. so KIF the Canadian International Faith and Family Film Festival uh, sprung up there are so many festivals that are like genre like horror or like you know animation geared towards one particular thing and we didn't really fit in mm. uh, so we wanted something not just for our faith but for family members because we're both family members and we both have children so we wanted to open the doors to everybody where it's like you don't have to leave the kids at home they're welcome everyone's welcome Beautiful. You know, and, and I, I, I see it as such a refreshing tool right now because when you look at the mountains of culture, you see uh, media, but also you see government, banking, education, you know, uh, in the areas of, of, of where we spend our time, but we spend most of our time in media. Now, where did, uh, where did you find that faith in your life, uh, Jason? Where did that start? Well, uh, I kind of always had my faith. Uh, I felt like God's presence was always with me, and I always felt like I had a sort of guardian angel. But then I sort of went away from that for a while, and God was kind of in the distance. He was always there, but sort of in the distance. Sort of on nodding terms. With yeah, you. waiting for me to come back. And I was sort of exploring and trying to find my way through the secular film and TV world, which is a lot to do with the vanity and the I. Mm. So you always think you're creating your future and you're manifesting, but you really aren't. Yeah. So then when I met my wife, um, and she took me to a Pentecostal church and just opened my eyes again, it was when a friend of mine turned and said, God's been waiting for you for 20 years. And I just hit me like a ton of bricks. I knew he was speaking to me. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it was my friend speaking, I knew it was God. Yeah. And that's when I just came back. It was like, welcome home, prodigal son. Yes. You know, it's like the intimate relationship came back, but deeper than I've ever imagined. You know, that's so beautiful because I know there's a lot of women right there that just said, Whoo! And, you know, there's hope for my husband, you know, yeah. because so many times we wonder, you know, what is it going to take in all of this? But you're saying it was one of those moments that I was brought to church, but it was the word that opened up my mind and my heart to Jesus. Yes. Uh, th what, what about yourself, Raphael? Well, the journey for me started back when I was younger, uh, back in high school. I, uh, did, I, I grew up a Catholic, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what a relationship with Jesus was. I had no idea. Yeah. And a friend of mine, Ralph Jalal, took me out to the Evangel Church in Montreal, and I was blown away. Yeah. I joined a youth group. I found fellowship. I was born again, and it was incredible. So we started our own Bible studies in high school. Yeah. 
And from there, uh, I studied theater and film and television. I lost my way, like many people do. And um, I came to know Christ by doing the film that we recently did, Adam's Testament. I did a lot of Bible research and study. You know, I felt like God was always with me. However, I was lost for a very long time. Yeah. And by doing the film, that was the pinnacle where things changed for me. Um, in post-production of the film, wow. I came to a place where I didn't know who I was anymore. I felt I couldn't provide as a father and a husband. I came to an ultimate low of wanting to commit suicide. Mm. And that all changed for me when I found Christ that night again. <laughs> Once again, you know, he knocked me down on my knees and I found him once again and everything's changed since then. Well, you know what? I know that uh, people see the glory, but they don't know the story. And uh -huh. that when we're, we're talking about Kif and, and, and how this is important for faith right now to be a part of others' experience. Is that really the, uh, the inspiration that has caused you guys to become so absolutely determined to make this happen? I think so. I, I, more so than anything else. We want to reach out to youth groups and young adult groups, be it Catholic or Baptist or any denomination. We're realizing youth groups are shrinking. Some areas of the church are growing. However, mm -hmm. the youth are not really uh, connecting with yeah. the church. So we're reaching out and we want them to be involved. We've, yeah. We're working with the Canadian Bible Society. We're working with Artists and Christian Testimony, which are, is our charity. Mm. Uh, and we're developing a public service announcement program where we could get youth groups involved. Now, this is exciting. So when, when you look at the festival, what, what do you envision? And tell us, how far along are you in? And where, where are we going to be able to connect in with this? Because I know you've got a lot of people on the edge of their seat now. Well, we're at year two now. So this is September 14, 15, and 16th at, mm -hmm. at Innes Town Hall, University of Toronto, okay. uh, year two. And we've already uh, surpassed the submissions from last year. Last year, we had about 110 submissions. Now we're about 150. We're going to hit 200 submissions from around the world in 17 countries. Wow. So uh, we're at kifflix.ca. Okay. And people can come to our website and follow uh, the progress and when we're gonna be announcing the films, which should be probably... Uh, end of August. End of August. We'll be announcing the lineup for this year. And we'll get a chance to get a sneak peek at what's taking place around the world and in Absolutely. faith films and family. And uh, what's, your, what's your vision and hope? Because, you know, when I saw you guys praying with each other as brothers, I said, man, it reminded me of the disciples of old, sends them out. <laughs> Jesus sent them out two by two right. to become fishers of men. And now you're just really fishing in a whole in, in environment of, of media and mm -hmm. uh, where it's so needed now. This is, I believe, such a, a very important need. We're uh, the scouts. Yes, you, you <laughs> are the scouts. What's your hope and what's your what's your your, your vision for this? Well, the Canadian International Faith and Family Film Festival is a place where we could gather and celebrate, celebrate our faith and yep. Jesus Christ. So really, our vision is to bring as many youth and young adults to this festival so we could get people together because it's so much more than just the festival. Yeah. We have panels and workshops and uh, seminars mm. and we have an awards show afterwards and different contests uh, throughout the weekend. So, wow. so we're, we're envisioning this being the largest faith and family film festival in Canada. <laughs> and we want to give a platform to some films that you may never see. A documentary about, say, a couple saving a village in a, in a foreign country, you know, uh, bringing, uh, bringing Jesus and God and the Word to some places in the world that have never experienced this. And these are actually f films that are exhibited at our festival. You, you know, when you, when you start talking about that, because there seems to be a greater sensitivity. We see the Apostle of Paul, we see, you know, the, the Passion of Christ and so many other movies that have been groundbreakers. Is, is this happening now in Canada where people are, like yourselves, are creating projects like this that are now getting the attention of the world? Absolutely. Yeah, it's one film at a time and it, and it, it birthed out of a need for our own film called Adam's Testament because we didn't have a platform. So that was part of the idea. We wanted to have films like this have a voice. And the film uh, Let There Be Like, Kevin Sorbo's film, uh, was the kind of premiere at our festival that won Best Picture. And that was another film that just really got out there around the world. Great now, message. This has not been without struggle. 
<laughs> because you know the the, the the struggle we we develop strength and uh, you both smile on that because yeah. there's been a cost to this as well and uh, how can we come into agreement and pray with you and pray for you because I, I believe that this needs no prayer no power some prayer some power much prayer much power well you could go to our website mm -hmm. www.kifflix.com mm -hmm. or .ca and uh, you can look at all the things that we have to offer Come and join us. Come out to the festival. Enjoy a movie. See a panel. See a seminar. You could really support us that way. And uh, your prayers are welcome. Prayers are very welcome. We know the power of prayer. And uh, we, Jason and I pray with our families every day. Yeah. And our message really is, if you're out there and you'd like to get involved in media or you want to be a volunteer, then reach out to us. We're going to try to do everything we can to help you. We're growing the kingdom in, in God's name, and uh, who are we to say who, who's not invited, right, in God's <laughs> kingdom? So our doors are open. Well, you know, I, I feel like this is a refreshing, uh, just a, an opportunity to see the Great Commission in a greater way. And I want to thank you. Thank, thank you, you so friend. much, Jason. Thank you, <laughs> Raphael. And that is the, the film festival, Faith and Family Film Festival. You can get more uh, information on our website, uh, one 855 700 And please continue to pray for them and with them. Well, Keith and, and Kristen share their story behind their music. And that's coming up next. Thank you. Are you thirsty? Are you empty? Come and drink these living water. Keith and Kristen Getty have carved out a unique niche in the world of Christian music as modern hymn writers. Their song, In Christ Alone, co written by Keith, is sung by an estimated 45 million people in churches each year. And in their new book, Sing, the Gettys champion a return to robust congregational singing. So music was part of your lives then from the outset. Yeah. yeah. From the, where did you guys meet? Well, we're both from Belfast, Northern Ireland. And I was 18, just about to go to college. He was 24. He was, was a little older. A little older. And my uncle um, came to preach at our church, and I was singing there that Sunday, my, a church my dad's a pastor at. And he heard me sing. He said, you know, you should meet this guy called Keith Getty. He's a believer, and he's into music, writes songs. You guys should meet. And so he introduced us. The Gettys married in 2004 and moved to America in 2006. They have three young daughters and a fourth on the way. One thing that drew them together was a mutual desire to produce Christian music with a different approach, modern hymns. When we first suggested it in the year 2000, it was just blank faces. Record labels wanted nothing to do with this. Nobody wanted anything. And then I think, I think the first thing was the reception of In Christ Alone. It, it came out in 2001. And that began to sort of knock the barn door open in terms of in terms of opportunity and Even people just began giving to hear. a worked example of what it was you were trying to do so when you said modern hymn people are going is that people in robes is that is that is that a is that a is that a, is that a hymn with a, a chorus you know nobody knew what it was but suddenly you say in christ alone oh we get it what is it god said the people come to me with their lips but their hearts are far from me so how do you get them to a place where worship is meaningful and not just we're going to sing these by rote the hymns go into your minds they go into your memory they go into your heart your emotions, they go into your prayers and your words. And that's why what we sing is so crucial. The number of people who've lost their faith, like whose faith has collapsed in a moment, because they suddenly get told Christianity is, is simplistic answers to difficult questions. Well, if that's the only kind of songs you sing, then your Christianity is simplistic answers to difficult questions. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, I think that when songs more fully explain who God is and connect to human experience at every level, it actually contributes to making us more authentic as believers. And of course, we know that singing in itself doesn't save anybody. Right. But it does point us so irresistibly to the one who can. Mm. If you can find a way of getting a melody that everybody can sing, a lyric that's worth holding on to and really is part of your life, you can carry with it with you in a more intentional way. And not just for that year while it's cool, but if you're aiming for a more timeless art, the chances are you could be singing something as a student when you're 21 and singing as a grandmother with your children. One of the foundational aspects of your teaching is singing as a family. That's right. Singing together 
Mm-hmm. Is, well, I know your family would do this, but you're mm-hmm. three girls, now four. You're going to have a choir soon. But, <laughs> but I'm working my we're way out of the job. We're to get four-part right harmony here. <laughs> <laughs> really? But uh, what about people who say, well, I can't sing. I don't have a That's voice. A I don't play an instrument. I'm not musical, et cetera, et cetera. All of us are created to sing, and God has decided that I've got a really a below-average voice. My wife's got a really above-average voice, and that's just, that's just the way it goes. But we've all been given confessional voices, not all you know, professional voices. They... I think it's how you categorize it, too. If you see singing as a specialist subject, you're musical or you're not. But if you consider it as a spiritual discipline, a joyful and wonderful one, akin to prayer, for example, we're all called to sing. There's a role the musicians play in the Old Testament. Uh, they went out before the army of the Lord. Is music uh, a weapon of our spiritual work? I absolutely think it is. And you know, psychologically, singing affects our brains in fabulous ways. We're designed that music affects us in a way that not all other things do. So that whenever I you know, wake up the next morning and I'm frustrated at myself, I think of before the throne of God above, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within upward, I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. In 2017, Keith was honored as an officer of the Order of the British Empire, which highlights good works of its citizens. The Queen of England <laughs> recognized you and, and, and gave you the, what award is that? It's the OBE? Yeah, well, that was, that was... You and Paul McCartney and <laughs> <laughs> Mick Jagger? Come on. Britain loves him. So I think it was, it, was, it, was, it was a bit of a surprise. It was the first, it was the first time they'd given it to a Christian musician. And it, but I think it's because Britain loves hymns. The hymns are, are very much part of the British, the right. Church, of, Church of England, the British historic kind of part life. Part of the culture. The Gettys are on their annual Christmas tour, which was turned into a PBS special in 2015. They make the most of sharing the deepest meaning of the holiday. With Bible readings and carols and um, punctuating that so that people would walk away with, well, what is Christmas? What is the story here? Um, and we've, enjo- we've enjoyed the intentionality about, yeah. of that and the opportunities for evangelism that comes through that. So we're excited. And it's a fun night as well, isn't it? Yep. Thousands of Baptists have been turned to dancing. <laughs> it's, you wouldn't believe it. That's a miracle. You, you wouldn't believe it. Well, what goes on in our Christmas show stays in our Christmas show. So. <laughs> you know, with Keith and Kristen, one of the things that you find is that art of just getting alone with God and loving on Him. Uh, it is not something that is in any way uh, a waste of time. And, and, and I love what they said. Singing on itself doesn't save anyone, but it is the discipline that we have. You know, as it says in 150th Psalm, it says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. And, and I love how bringing those hymns back and, and, and what they do, because we're all singing on the same key, and where it, it becomes an anthem that begins to lift up and when the enemy comes in and tells you that you can't make it, it's the songs of the faith and it's the, the word of God that says that I'm rooted and grounded and my future is secure in Jesus Christ. And yours is also, and you're going to be doomed to the bottomless pit. You know, that's what worship allows us to do. And it sets us free. I love what uh, Kristen said. She says, uh, physiologically, singing affects our brains in fabulous ways. We're designed that music affects us in all sorts of ways. I wonder if you've got something, a project on your heart, and you're asking God to to put some horsepower in it, and uh, you need that help. Succeeding God's way beyond the limits. I believe this is the generation that God is saying, go beyond the limits. If you've seen what we've done in the past, don't erase the past, embrace it, but go beyond the limits. If you need that help, 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. I just love those, that couple, Christ alone. Up next, an alcoholic finds hope because of a TV program. Hmm. <laughs> Take a look. Sharon Pate Bell worked for 20 years as a merchant marine in New Orleans. She had the mouth to prove it. Cursing was my best friend, and I had a lot of friends who cursed. That was the language we used. And uh, I learned how to intimidate people by my mouth. In 1998, her heroin-addicted husband was found shot to death in the New Orleans housing projects. 
I just got a phone call one day that um, he had been killed. I, I just felt my whole world come down. I was just really devastated. And um, I was left to raise our son by myself. And the only way I could deal with it was to drink because it would really numb the pain. Her drinking went on for years. Sharon became a full-fledged alcoholic. I went to the club right on in the worst part of town and just drank every day till I would just be drunk. I'd wake up in the morning, uh, even sometimes without eating, and that would be the first thing I would want was a drink. My body just would need a drink. I didn't want to be that way, but I just didn't know how to change. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Sharon and her young son relocated to Baton Rouge, where she rented a small house. I had a chance to sober up, and I would just come here and pray and hope that God would just help me, because remember now, I lost everything I had. I had nothing. She started reading a Bible and watching the 700 Club every day on TV. And this one particular day, there was a story about this man who had a drinking problem and how God had healed him. All I remember was my hands were up. I was asking God to touch me and to heal me. And I felt the presence of God come in the room. And I knew then that it was over. I felt the freedom. Before, I was not drinking because I was scared. But I felt God when he entered my heart. And the desire just left. Sharon gave her life to Jesus and was instantly set free from her addiction to alcohol. She didn't even realize it until a few weeks later. Somebody offered me a drink. And before I knew it, I said, oh, I don't drink. And then when I said it, it came out so quickly. I was like, yeah, that's right. I, I, don't, I don't drink. And I don't want to drink. And I never think about drinking. I could walk down the store, down the aisle, and see liquor, and it doesn't even cross my mind. It's like it never happened. Complete, total healing. Sharon went back to college and recently graduated with honors. Her son just graduated from high school, also with honors. Her life is brand new, and so is her mouth. My mouth is to bless. My mouth is to praise. My mouth is used for worship. I thank God for healing me. I thank God for delivering me. Thank God for cleaning up my life. And most of all, just giving me back my mind. And he said, if I keep my mind on him, he'll keep me in perfect peace. And that the peace that I have today is not the kind of peace that the world has. This is a peace in the midst of the storm. I still can trust God. I still can believe God. And today, he's turned my whole life around. Sharon encourages people who are addicted, like she was, to put their trust in God. It doesn't matter if your husband's a junkie. It doesn't matter if you, you're an alcoholic. It doesn't matter if you're even struggling with drugs. God can deliver you in the midst of it. He can touch your heart. He can change your taste buds. Once you can get into the presence of God, it does things that nobody else can do for you. You can have a different life. So what do you think angels do? What, what's their purpose? God's messengers. Serve God. I think they give us messages. Flying over us and protecting us. I, I just know that they're up there. I guess I believe in the fact that other people could be your angels, right? I don't know if you call them angels, but I believe that somebody's watching over us, taking care of us. I don't know, guarding me or something like that. Welcome back. 
We'd like to invite you to become a partner with the 700 Club Canada. For just $20 a month, you can link arms with us and carry this message of Jesus Christ across this nation from sea to sea and rivers to the ends of the earth. And as our thank you, we'd love to get into your hands this amazing DVD called Angels. It literally talks about the power and the purpose of these angelic beings. And Pat Robertson breaks it down and shares it like none other. It would be such an encouragement if you'd call right now. 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. Thank you in advance. And today I want to do a, something a little bit different because God has been working uh, today in the area of technology and media and entertainment. I remember a little while back we had uh, James from Faith Tech and he was talking about you are not alone. Now, if you want to see one of those past shows, just subscribe to our 700 Club Canada YouTube channel or 700club.ca, 700club.canada.ca. But I want to pray for you and let's use the media that has been used for darkness for so long for the very power of extending the kingdom of God and bringing light. Hey, open up your heart right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, from sea to sea and rivers to the ends of the earth, in this 151st year that we celebrate the birth of Canada, we believe that the next 150 years, Lord, 49 are going to be even greater. And you're raising up pioneers, men and women, who are in these areas of media that are going to use it for the glory of God. Lord, I pray as a spiritual father in the land that that spirit and the power of the air would be shut down over Canada, but there would be a loosing of witty inventions and ideas, and they would come to the forefront, like the KIF and like Faith Tech and so, so many others. The sky is the limit. Lord, for your glory and for your namesake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, receive that. I receive it on your behalf. And hold on to this, this power verse, 1 Peter 5.10, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Hey, that's you, and that's the North, strong and free. <laughs> God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Hi, I'm Jason. And I'm Raphael. And we're the founders of the Canadian International Faith and Family Film Festival. Better known as KIF. We have some great submissions this year, guys. Films like The Indivisible by Pure Flix, The Identical starring Ray Liotta, and Catherine of Sinai starring the late great Peter O'Toole in his final performance. Last year's submissions included films such as Kevin Sorbo's Let There Be Light and biblical features like Saul, Journey to Damascus. So join us on September 14, 15, and 16th at Innes College, University of Toronto. Or visit us at kifflix.ca. On tomorrow's show. I was afraid. I was so skinny, so unhealthy. I felt like people think I'm just nasty, I'm just a prostitute.